Cliff, uh, I hate to spoil a party, but uh, perhaps we should think about uh, starting with our presentation. Uh, we want to thank all of you for, for coming uh, uh, for this discussion about the results of our uh, two-plus year uh, effort at MIT to look at the future of natural gas, uh, particularly uh, as it pertains uh, to a uh, carbon-constrained uh, uh, future. Uh, I'm Ernie Moniz uh, from MIT. I'm, I, I direct the Energy Initiative. My colleagues here, uh, Tony Meggs, uh, our co-chairs, uh, Tony Meggs, uh, who uh, is a visiting engineer at MIT uh, and has led, as you will hear, our supply team. Uh, Professor Henry, Henry Jacoby, uh, Jake Jacoby, uh, uh, who, is, who is their co-director uh, for another several days uh, of the joint program on the science and policy of uh, global change, and you will hear him describe uh, kind of our sy synthetic uh, modeling uh, in terms of the energy, the energy future. Uh, before we start, I'd like to just recognize uh, that we have uh, a very distinguished uh, and extraordinarily helpful advisory committee. We always give the disclaimer. Uh, the results are, are our responsibility, uh, but they have certainly uh, provided us a very important perspective uh, and, and, and assistance. Uh, Greg Staple uh, from the American Clean Skies Foundation, uh, also a major supporter of the study. Uh, Colin Davies, next to him, uh, from Hess Oil. Uh, Velo Kuskra, who is somewhere here, ARI. Um, Ted Roosevelt IV, uh, Barclays Clean Tech. Uh, Neil Elliott, uh, ACEEE, uh, Reed Detchen from the American Future Coalition is, uh, sorry, Energy, I'm Ener sorry, Energy Future Coalition, thank you. And also I'd like to say two members of their steering committee, uh, Boyden Gray and, uh, uh, and uh, Bob Fry are, are here as well. Uh, and Denise Bodie um, from the American Wind uh, Association. So, uh, and hope will soon, we believe, uh, we're dependent upon the U.S. Air Shuttle, um, which apparently is not performing perfectly uh, by observation. Uh, that Mac McClarty is not here yet. He's the chairman of, of our advisory committee, but hopefully we'll be here and make some comments later on. And finally, uh, before starting, let me introduce also, we have a num number of other members, key members of our uh, gas study uh, team. Um, Dan Cohn. Uh, is the executive director of, uh, of our study. And for those of you who stay around to ask questions, I'll say a little bit, Dan in particular has led our transportation uh, work. Uh, Melanie Kinderdine, uh, executive director of the Energy Initiative, uh, and she has led the work on infrastructure and some work uh, on, uh, on the power, power sector. Uh, Frank O'Sullivan uh, here has been a key stalwart in the, again, in the supply team. Uh, Sergei Palsev, next to him, uh, in terms of the economic, uh, economic modeling. Uh, Joe Heizer, uh, Joe was over there, well known in this town uh, probably, and has helped us a lot, uh, particularly in some of the power issues as well. And, and a student, uh, Nikhil uh, Rachakanda, uh, who uh, is the one person here who did, did real work, uh, particularly in the power sector. So, um, so with that, and, and please when we're finished, uh, really, I mean, feel free to uh, ex extend the discussion with, with any, any of our team, team members. Thank you. So I'm just going to give a brief framing uh, before turning it over uh, to my colleagues. Let me just say that uh, in some sense the two major motivations that uh, led us to uh, uh, work on this future of natural gas study, which follows on to our earlier work on the future of nuclear power and the future of coal, uh, really, really two, two major drivers. One is, of course, even going back a few years, uh, the, uh, the raising din of discussion concerning uh, shale gas and how that uh, might imply uh, a major reassessment of, of, of particularly United States uh, gas resources. And then the um, discussions, um, concepts, statements about natural gas uh, as a key bridge to a low carbon future. Uh, statements that, frankly, in, at least in my view, were, did not have too much more behind them uh, than being statements. And part of our, our, our work has been to analyze these, these drivers uh, 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 in, a, in a technically sound way. And I'll just say that basically, uh, in terms of major conclusions, uh, and we'll, we'll be going through this as, as we go along, that fundamentally, by any appropriate measure, we will see that gas uh, supply uh, at reasonable cost, even including uncertainty, is in fact significant. 
uh, it will play a particularly large role uh, under carbon constraints uh, in the power sector. Uh, however, if we go into the uh, more distant future uh, with very stringent carbon constraints, eventually all fossil fuels, uh, unless capture and sequestration are entered, uh, will, be, will be limited by carbon. But this is the context in which uh, gas really is a bridge to the low carbon future. Uh, we don't know quite what the landing point is, and we don't know the span of the, of the bridge completely, but that's what we will discuss in quantitative terms as we go forward. And finally, another major, a major uh, conclusion, and we'll again explain this, is how the evolution of the global gas market structure uh, in the time horizon of our study, which is mid-century, uh, can also have major impacts on the U.S. market in terms of price, in terms of demand, in terms of the import-export uh, equation. We do all of this uh, addressing a set of uncertainties, like the ultimate size and cost of the natural gas resource base. A, big, a major uncertainty, what will greenhouse gas mitigation policy be in this country uh, and globally? Uh, what will be the technology mix over time? What we do, of course, assumes cost structure for various technologies. We have to look at what might happen with, with the variation. And finally, this issue I alluded to, what will be the evolution of international gas markets? Three of these, the first, third, and fourth, are amenable to analysis, and we will present analysis. The second one is amenable to policy and politics, uh, and you will hear how we address that through a variety of, of, of scenarios. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Tony Meggs, uh, who will uh, summarize the, uh, the supply findings and recommendations. Uh, thanks, Annie, and thank you all for coming. Uh, I will be very brief uh, and uh, just present a few of our key conclusions uh, around supply. Uh, so first of all, uh, it's important to understand the approach that we have, uh, we have taken in our, in our work um, because it really frames uh, everything we do. First of all, we're building on existing assessment data. There are several uh, highly reputable bodies, some of whom are represented in this room, who have very large staffs uh, doing continuous uh, uh, resource assessments. We have built on that and sifted through that and come up with our own uh, uh, analysis based on that data. We have not uh, undertaken uh, a lot of original geological work. Uh, secondly, and importantly, we treat resources as an economic concept. This is kind of self-evident to uh, many people, but uh, when, when talking about gas resources, one frequently hears very large numbers bandied around which are essentially uh, context-free. The amount of resource is a function of the price of the resource, uh, and we, will, we use that concept extensively, and we'll demonstrate it here. And thirdly, and very importantly, recognizing uh, and embracing uh, uncertainty. Uh, anybody who looks at the history of the natural gas business in the United States, and particularly the assessments of supply, will see a pretty dramatic roller coaster ride. Uh, we've been long gas, we've been short gas, we've been long, we've been short, and now we're long again. Uh, and if you think this is the end of the story, uh, then, uh, you know, I've got something I want to sell you. Uh, so we try to encapsulate that uncertainty and understand the impact of that uncertainty on the policy cases that Jake will demonstrate shortly. Key findings are really very simple. Globally, there are abundant supplies of low-cost natural gas resources. The natural gas business globally is a very immature business. It's a very mature business in the United States, but outside of the United States, by our estimates, not much more than 10% of the total ultimately recoverable volumes of conventional gas have been discovered, uh, have been used. Uh, and furthermore, there are unknown quantities, frankly, of unconventional gas that could significantly increase the numbers, which are around 16,000 trillion cubic feet uh, with a wide range of uncertainty, which is about 150 times current uh, annual consumption. So a lot of gas at very modest prices. Unconventional gas will make an important contribution to US energy supplies. I think uh, that comes as no surprise. They already do make a big contribution. 
the uh, recent uh, innovation, technological innovations around shale have uh, substantially improved the outlook. And thirdly and importantly, the environmental impacts of shale gas development are manageable but challenging. Uh, and uh, we need to recognize that. And there's a way of moving this, yeah. Okay, so this chart looks at remaining recoverable resources globally. It includes unconventional gas in the United States, that's shale gas, tight gas, coal bed methane. Does not include them in the rest of the world because frankly the numbers are so unreliable as to be essentially close to meaningless. There's undoubtedly a lot there, but how much requires a lot more work to uh, understand. So this represents the summation of, uh, of uh, proven reserves, reserve growth, resources yet to be discovered, and unconventional gas in the United States and Canada. It's around 16,000 trillion cubic feet with a range probably from 12 to 20,000. Uh, two points, uh, one is the concentration of the resources. Like oil, or perhaps by some measures even more than oil, Globally, gas is concentrated in a few areas. There's a lot of it, but a lot of it is in a few places. Uh, and they aren't always uh, places that, um, well, no, no, I'm, uh, <laughs> enough uh, extemporizing. Back onto the message. <laughs> uh, the recommendation here uh, is a sort of adjunct to the uh, discussion of, of, of unconventional gas. Clearly, as we describe at more length in the report, there are strategic reasons why it would be very desirable for, our, uh, for people in other parts of the world to develop unconventional supplies. The US has enormous expertise in this matter, and it is in, our strategic, it's in the US strategic interest uh, to assist other parts of the world in the development of those resources. Here is a supply curve, um, and what, this, what a supply curve is, is uh, on the uh, y-axis the break-even gas price which on the x-axis will allow over time a certain resource, uh, cumulative resource to be developed and produced. So just to illustrate this, at prices at or below four dollars per million BTU at the point of export, we think that somewhere between eight and ten thousand trillion cubic feet uh, uh, of, uh, of gas can be developed, which is really very low cost. Uh, if you convert it into oil terms, you'll see how low it is. Uh, however, that stuff needs to be exported, at least to get to the United States or, or other global markets, uh, and uh, this does not include the considerable costs of transport. So one factor, feature of natural gas is that transport costs, shown here at four bucks in this example, uh, transport costs represent a considerable, and in many cases, the majority of the costs of delivering that gas to market. And, and that constrains the development of the global market in natural gas. It's one of the features. Now, here is the same curve, curves for the US. Uh, on, uh, on this side, uh, we look at the total uh, uh, US supply, around 2,100 TCF, with again a significant range of uncertainty uh, for f what's yet to be discovered uh, uh, and also uh, around some of the unconventional supplies. And then on the right, we break that down a little bit. And what we show uh, here is coal bed methane, uh, tight gas. Uh, this is conventional supply going up here. Uh, and then this is shale here. Uh, and you can see that um, Again, a lot of uncertainty around all of these numbers, but nevertheless, over 600 trillion cubic feet mean estimate of shale supplies, uh, and a lot of that uh, at relatively low prices, uh, certainly lower than the equivalent uh, conventional supplies. So what we see now is the result of these uh, cost curves, that is um, uh, the displacement of some conventional supply with shale gas and, and other un unconventional su supplies. Um, I have three more slides. How am I doing for time, gents? Three minutes. Oh, three minutes. Um, science and technology, we spend a lot of time looking at this and I really can't do it justice. Let me just say that with respect to shale, 
Uh, it is our view that there's a lot to be done with respect to developing a holistic and system-wide understanding of the shale gas. There's a lot of gas being developed, um, but it's being done on a rather empirical basis. Uh, and it is in the United States' interest to have a better understanding of the underlying science of how the shales work so that we can ensure, as a nation, uh, that these resources are developed in the optimal uh, manner. So we're recommending a DOE-sponsored additional uh, collaborative uh, R&D. Just a quick slide here to say, to, to reflect on uh, some, some of the history of R&D on gas in the US. Uh, and this shows um, uh, R&D expenditures, uh, and well, these are R&D expenditures in the development of coal bed methane. And then there is additional expenditure. Oh, I think I actually, hang on. Federal funding, GRI funding, that is a, uh, a, a joint uh, off-budget uh, funding, uh, R&D funding, uh, and then a time-limited tax credit. Uh, and then uh, this demonstrates the gas produced under the tax credit. This is all coal bed methane. And then the gas produced after the tax credit. The bottom line of this is that this combination of federally funded uh, uh, R&D and the appropriate tax uh, credits for a limited period of time created an industry that is now producing around about 10% of all the gas in the United States. So this stuff can work, and we do recommend um, uh, uh, further research uh, in, in some of the newer areas. Uh, my last slide, uh, quickly, on environmental issues. Um, we don't underestimate uh, the risks associated with any oil and gas development activity. Um, and there have been you know, many discussions ongoing around shale development and its particular uh, challenges. We, we do think, after uh, you know, a lot of consideration and a lot of discussions with a lot of people and looking at the actual issues, that they are manageable. On this list of risks, I would have to say that surface water contamination is really the primary risk. Uh, the other risks are, are really de minimis um, and can be re readily managed. I think surface water contamination is one area where in those parts of the country where the industry is well developed, where there are multiple, literally tens of thousands of water disposal wells, uh, this is not an issue. But in some newer areas um, uh, uh, of development, such as the Marcellus and in uh, Pennsylvania and elsewhere, um, more needs to be done. So we have a number of uh, recommendations uh, around environmental issues. Uh, and there's much more I can say, but in, in deference to my colleagues, uh, I move. Invite Jacob. Thank you. Well, part of the study was to was to get a 10,000 foot view of this industry um, and, and uh, various influences on it. And so to do this, we, we, we use a set of economic uh, models. Uh, 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 one is uh, uh, the emissions prediction and policy analysis model is a 16 region global model of economic development, technology, energy, environment, um, emissions, and the like. And then there's a US version of that, US, represent, uh, US uh, regional version of that, which we used to do this, this kind of analysis. I'm happy to discuss those at great and disgust, disgusting length, but I'll spare you now, <laughs> except to say that the strength of these models and why we do this is, is to look at that the various interactions on this industry, and there, you'll see various forces that are at work, and that's the advantage of this, but it's also important to understand the limitations. You necessarily sacrifice a lot of industry detail when you do this. So what you should see in these results is, is uh, not the exact number that we come up with, but, but the general trends, the general insights you can draw from looking at how these various, uh, how these various uh, influences interact and, and work on the industry. Uh, this is described in more detail than I will do here in the report, and also on our website is an even longer, uh, longer description of this. And we look at various things, not all of which I can talk about here, but we, but we, look, we look through the list of things that, that Ernie talked about. We, look, we use the estimates you saw of the different, uh, uh, of, the, of the uncertainty in the, in the resources, both in the US and abroad. We look at three different scenarios of, of greenhouse, uh, greenhouse gas emission policies. 
Uh, there's there's a, lot, a good deal of work on the sensitivity of any results we get to particularly technology costs and the like discussed in the report. And important in what we're doing is um, to understand what might be the implications of what Ernie mentioned as potential changes in the structure of the international gas market. So you can imagine if you had all these factors, we can generate more scenarios than a person could look at. We've looked at a subset of those, and I'll even speak uh, about an even smaller group here. Now, just to, to set the text about what I mean, what we mean by the, by the structure of the international gas market, right now, the way the gas markets in the United States are, uh, and, and the rest of the world are structured is that there are three essentially regional markets. There's some trade between these, but it's very small. You have a market in North America, uh, U.S., uh, Canada, and Mexico. There's essentially what we would call a market in Europe, which is Russia and the European countries and, and, and North Africa and some from the Gulf, and a market in Asia. Uh, the, uh, with the major demanding countries in Asia, supply sources in Asia, and supply, supplies out of, out of the Gulf. Most of what I will show you is, uh, assumes that this particular structure of where you have trade within these markets, but not a lot of trade between them, if that changes, then the situation for the United States uh, changes, and you'll get trade, uh, a more t tightly integrated market. I'll come by that, back to that in a moment. Now, there, there, there are, I, I think that there are just four points to make, and then I'll show some pictures to illustrate those points. First point, if gas is given a level playing field, means that it gets, it gets to compete on an economic basis with other technology, gas, particularly with this cir circumstance that Tony has described, gas is a winner. If you have no climate policy and you take the, these, uh, these, these estimates of gas resources, then gas, gas use in the United States by our projections would go up by 40 to 50 percent over the next, oh, to 2050. And, and if you have a a, 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 a carbon price policy, if you use some sort of a price on CO2 or price on greenhouse gas emissions as your, as your uh, agreement greenhouse policy, then, then, then gas is a winner, first point. Second point, if you go to a regulatory scheme, and I'll show you an example of that, what happens to gas is not so clear. Might, gas might be a benefit, might, and gas might make a larger a large contribution. We might get the advantage of these resources. Uh, other systems might. You, you might not. Uh, third point, if you're, in a, if you're in a kind of a price regime, then uh, gas is dom going to dominate the electric power sector on economic basis. That's the third point. Fourth point, that is this point about international markets, which I'll show in a moment, which it, 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 the situation in the United States could face, not in the next 15 or 20 years, but longer time could, could change substantially. And the final point is that um, uh, uh, it's not, the gas is a bridge, but it's not, it's not like the bridge across the ch mouth of the Chesapeake that goes on and forever and ever and ever. Gas goes, it's a bridge for a while. And so, it, so that if you look at these in, a, in an overall systems context, there is a serious question about, about what, is the, what is the landing point on the other side that this bridge goes to. Just a few points to make that, to, make, to illustrate that. This is just a picture of, of uh, on the left hand margin is, uh, is uh, gas TCF. And these, there, are th there are four sets of bars, 2020, 2030, 2040, 2050. And the, each of the three bars is are th from the three cost curves that you saw, from, you saw from Tony. And this is a case which we made up, which is a, 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 a CO2 policy case where we have 50% reduction to 2050 in U United States greenhouse gas emissions. Now, we're not trying to approximate any particular policy proposal in the United States, Waxman, Markey, or or carry, or whatever. It just we have no offsets, and we and we, we take the policies that are in place today, but not proposals that are on the on the table. And uh, just to, just to give an an, uh, an an example to see how does gas fare in that 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 kind of world. And you and you see the the the, the heavy blue at the bottom of the bars is imports, and the little green part in the top is exports. We export primarily to Mexico. There's some some exports to Canada, but net imports. And what you see in this, just want to see one thing in this picture, is that under this kind of policy, gas wins. That is, e even, with, even with a very, very stringent policy, then we would be consuming as much gas in the United States at the, at, in 2050 as, as we are today. But in the process, the fundamental structure and the fundamental role of gas in the total U.S. picture will have changed completely. But this is the, second, this is the first point. Gas wins on a level playing field. And, and, what, and I'll, I'll just point out one thing, that's that, that uh, this, this numbers just show the producer price and the consumer price. The producer price is, uh, is what you might compete with LNG or other uh, imports. Uh, producer price is what's influencing the demand side. 
So why is this happening? What's happening in the electric power sector? Take this price-based case, very simple, not, exact, not, not the complexities that many of you deal with in the current policy domain, but just a simple case to make it clear what we're talking about. And what happens, not surprisingly, gas drives out coal. That's not a surprise in this game, because if you're gonna, if you're gonna, raise, the, if you're gonna raise the price of carbon, gas is gonna drive out coal. In our, in our reference numbers, gas is cheaper going forward on an economic basis than renewables. And gas is cheaper than anything with CCS. And gas is cheaper than nuclear until very late in this process. Now, we've done a lot of sensitivity testing. We make different assumptions. We get somewhat different results. We talk about that. But I think these are reasonable expectations that gas is the big winner in this sector. And of course, one of the big things that happens in this picture, of course, is there's a substantial demand reduction. That cross-section is the effect of, of, uh, of, uh, of this policy on, on demand. So it's a huge demand effect but a big displacement of, of coal by gas. And an important picture to see here makes the point about the bridge, is that, oh, I'm sorry, let me go, but if you go to, oops, if you go to total energy first, a big effect on total energy because, because of, the, because of the, uh, the price effect on, the, on total demand. And gas, there's a slightly less, there's almost the same amount of gas in the period is, at, at the end of the period as there is now. This is the mean, mean, mean case there. But what, you, what, what, what I'd like you to see here is that gas sustains very well over this system, but look at the difference in the relative role of gas in 2050 in relation to the relative role of gas today. Maybe it's 20% today, it's about 40% in 2050. This, would, this is what would happen under an economic policy. The other thing to notice here is as you get to the end of this period, gas itself becomes too expensive and too dirty. As you squeeze down this system to meet this target, you can't burn the gas or at least the cost of burning the gas is too high. And if you push this out further and further squeeze this policy to even tighter CO2 targets, then gas is driven out of the system. This is the bridge point, is that if we don't have anything at the other end of this bridge, then we can't do a policy like this, or at least you couldn't go beyond this point and achieve targets. What if we used a regulatory scheme? Uh, there are uh, as many regulatory schemes as we can imagine as there are people in this room, but we just pick one. Just to, just, to, just to illustrate what might be. And then we said, suppose we had a 25% renewable energy standard. That means the electric utility has to have 25% of its generation from renewable sources by 2030. And then we were forced the retirement of coal, 50, we were forced the retirement of 55% of the coal by the end of the period. What happens there? Well, one of the things you're gonna see is that you don't get the big demand effect because we only have policies, the only demand effect you're getting is because these policies are more expensive, but you're not getting the overall effect of the carbon price. So what you see is that what happens to gas, you see gas is kind of squeezed here. You have, the, you have the increasing renewables, and of course coal is going down, and, and how, how well gas does in this period, how much gas we produce in this period, depends on the relative juxtaposition of these two policies. How, how tough is the RES, how fast do we move the, the, the coal things, it, 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 it makes a big difference. So it's not quite, in a, in a, in a, you have to have very much d greater detail to think about what the effects are in a, in a regulatory world. Uh, over time, if you do this, these are both policies in the, in the, in the electric sector. Of course, if, you, if, you, if, you, if gas is not penetrating the electric sector, the gas is cheaper. So it slides into the other sector so that gas itself continues to do quite well, even though, it's, even though it's pushed out of the electric sector by these policies. So these are the kind of overall systems things we need to think about when we, when we look at, uh, at, at these kinds of policies. Uh, I'll just make one point about the international market evolution. This is the picture I showed you before of, 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 the, of the, uh, uh, the, uh, the imports, the, ne the net production, the exports of gas un under a regulatory, uh, under, under a climate policy. Uh, with uh, pot prices, and, but what if you had, let me go back one step, what if you had a, what if you had a global market? The assumption here is, is a kind, this is kind of a bookend of what these markets might do. One is that they don't change very much. You don't have trade among the existing regional markets very much more than there is today, and it's quite small. What if it developed to be more like the oil market, so that, so that you had a ver more tightly integrated global gas market? Uh, at what would that look like? What would, what would be the effect of that? Now, that's a, that, that's a pretty extreme case, so we're not projecting that. We're just saying we're likely headed in that direction, and what, what does that mean? Of course, what it means is that, the United States, that, 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 that over time, the United States would begin to import gas, but on the assumption that these other countries are gonna produce the gas, 
And this, if the, 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 the market's going to develop that way, the United States would import gas. Uh, if you think about it costing around $4 to ship the LNG around, is that a good number? And you think about the net back price of gas is 3 to $4. Well, by 2020, 2030, the price of the United States is getting to that level. The United States will begin to import more gas. So we may well, as we go forward in time, be moving to a, to a, to a, to a market where we would import gas because it's cheaper to import it than it is to develop it domestically. Not projection. It's something that we need to think, uh, we need to think about. And, of course, the argument that we make is that because this is because is that this lowers the price of gas in the United States. You'll note that for, many, for, for, for several decades, the total gas production in the United States doesn't go up, but because the prices are lower, the demand is higher, but we're importing more. So it's a kind of a double-edged sword. It's, it's economically helpful to the United States to have this kind of an inter efficient, efficient market because it, it, it's to our advantage to have so, to, to, to access to, to uh, cheaper sources of gas. It also implies a greater, a greater uh, Im import to the United States. That raises a set of issues about the international political implications about this, which are above my pay grade, so I will turn back to Ernie Moniz. Thank you. Okay, well, uh, thanks, uh, thanks, Jake. Uh, in fact, I will add a comment with this slide still in front of me, that, uh, that as uh, uh, Jake said, uh, in this uh, global market uh, versus the regional market, we see the economic uh, benefit we see these imports growing, but in fact, the demand is so much higher that if you look at these, let's say, median supply cases, 2040, domestic production actually is not decreased that much at all because the demand has gone up, uh, and so it's nothing like a one-for-one -one substitution of imports for, for domestic production. Okay. So, um, so we've seen the supply picture, and it is pretty robust. We've seen analytically, if you like, and quantitatively what a bridge means, and it does in fact seem to emerge quite robustly as well uh, uh, with, these, uh, with these cost structures. Uh, let's just go back now a little bit and drill down on a couple of issues uh, on the demand side. Uh, as Jake mentioned, there is resilience in that if there is less use in gas in one sec sector, it can come up, come up because of the lower prices with increase in some other sector. But let's focus a little bit on uh, uh, which we did in, in this interim report, uh, two areas uh, that are major growth areas for gas, potential major growth areas for gas. Electricity, which as we saw in the analysis, does emerge as a very, very large growth area. And transportation, which today is, is small, but is being discussed at least uh, as a possible major area. Now, we'll have a lot more of this, and there's more in the report, but let me just give a few of the conclusions. I'm going to start from the bottom and work up in a certain sense. Uh, on transportation, we looked at three issues. Uh, on LNG for long-haul trucks, uh, with current costs and current technologies, it does not look to us to be, uh, to be terribly attractive. Uh, CNG, uh, compressed natural gas, a uh, different story. Of course, we already see compressed natural gas in high mileage sectors, uh, taxis, uh, short-haul, uh, buses, et cetera, and uh, there, uh, we get a financial, uh, a cost advantage in terms of the fuel costs, at least again with current, current prices. It's about $1.30 spread uh, in terms of the equivalent uh, gallon, gallon of gasoline. Uh, and we also have a carbon benefit, which ends up being like a ton per year for a, for a, for a passenger car. Uh, okay? Now, um, here, the costs, the capital costs are still such that uh, there is a relatively long payback period, uh, however, for conventional light passenger vehicles. We do, however, make a strong recommendation that in the United States we have regulatory barriers that make that capital cost unnecessarily high, certainly compared to experience, say, in Europe, uh, whether it's for new vehicles or for retrofit vehicles, and we feel that those barriers should be removed, gas should be able to compete, uh, and eventually, uh, if price spreads in oil and gas go up, if carbon prices become high, uh, in fact, an alternative run of the economic model uh, shows that CNG can, in fact, penetrate in several decades at a very substantial level. Uh, the third issue that we looked at was natural gas to liquid fuels. Uh, and in particular, what we focused on was gas to methanol. 
Uh, methanol is an alcohol like ethanol, uh, lower energy density than gasoline, high octane, uh, et cetera. Uh, it's a well-established industry. We know the cost structure, dollar and a half a gallon uh, today, for example, uh, for, uh, for, for methanol. But once again, we have serious barriers. We have nothing like, shall we say, an open fuel standard. So ethanol, for example, has a major push behind it. Methanol is essentially outlawed uh, in ter terms of its use. So once again, we feel that what we should do is, is level the playing field. I want to emphasize the gas to methanol would not be a carbon measure. It would be an oil displacement measure, okay? Uh, but these are three possible, uh, possible uses of, of LNG. And our main recommendation, again, is level the playing field. Uh, and there certainly are places where gas, gas could, could expand in transportation. Moving to electricity, two issues we looked at uh, were the interplay of intermittent sources, wind and solar, basically, uh, with high variability and uncertainty uh, in, the, in, in output. Uh, and then this question that Jake uh, uh, displayed in the economic modeling is absolutely critical if one is to uh, pursue a uh, carbon mitigation strategy, namely the substitution of, of, uh, for coal uh, by, by gas. Let me just comment on the second one. We look at both short and long-term uh, impacts. That is, the short-term means dispatching what you have today. And frankly, and today, if you get more renewables on a certain day, you will typically displace uh, the highest variable cost uh, uh, source. And in most parts of the United States, uh, that's, that's gas. And that's, that's fine. That's what it is. Longer term, however, is the question, uh, how would a commitment to rapidly growing or, or growth to a large, large uh, uh, market share of intermittent sources uh, affect capacity planning uh, in a system? And the bottom line is, barring, of course, a major breakthrough in terms of economic large-scale storage, then gas is what we need to firm up uh, that, that, that supply in a reliable system. And so that would drive the need for a lot of additional gas capacity in the system. That does not necessarily translate into high utilization of that capacity. Uh, and so, in fact, as that combination of renewables and, and gas capacity uh, in effect becomes part of your, quotes, baseload uh, source, coal, uh, uh, for example, uh, being driven out, there will be need for new regulatory structures. It could be expansion of capacity markets. It could be uh, imposing ancillary service uh, incentives uh, that we will need to manage that capacity, uh, that gas capacity, to make sure we do, in fact, have uh, a, uh, a robust system. So let me say a few more words in detail about the substitution issue, uh, uh, gas, uh, gas for coal. Uh, we have in the report, you'll see a, a, a national map, state by state, which gives you an idea along the following lines. What might be the potential for substituting existing natural gas combined cycle capacity, high efficiency gas capacity, which today is used at about a 41% average capacity factor in the United States, against especially, well, against coal, and logically against the least efficient coal plants that in fact are not candidates for carbon capture and sequestration in the future because you must start with a, with a much higher efficiency plant. So that gives you an, a rough idea, but a rough idea can be misleading because you actually have to manage a system with variable demand, et cetera. So what we did is we looked at one test case the ERCOT system, essentially Texas, because it's a more or less isolated system, and ran a detailed model uh, in terms of existing capacity and infrastructure and bottlenecks, et cetera. So what you see here is on the left, that bar on the left is, is the nameplate capacity uh, in the ERCOT system, uh, with, that's nuclear in the bottom, hydro. Of relevance to our discussion particularly is the coal and the natural gas combined cycle. The blue at the top is the gas combustion turbines and, and gas steam turbines. It's, re it's really kind of your peaking capacity. But we're going to focus on coal and NGCC existing capacity. On the right, what you see is a set of dispatch curves. That means over the year, what is the mix of sources serving the electricity load? Each pair of bars on the left is today's dispatch based upon lowest 
variable cost. On the right will be a bar in which, through some policy mechanism, we have an envir environmental dispatch of the natural gas plants, the NGCC plants, ahead of the, of the coal plants, but in the actual system. The left-hand two bars are what you see for the 40 hours of the year of the maximum uh, demand, and on the right is what you see on a nice springtime day uh, when the overall demand is lower. So what do we finally see here? What we see is, if you go to the, to the far left, high demand, basically you need everything, and there's very little displacement of coal. But that's only a short time of the year. On the right, what you see is essentially a, a very large displacement of coal. The middle is the average over the full year. And what you see is that drop in the coal filled in by NGCC corresponds to a 22% reduction of CO2 in that system. So that's something that's available essentially today with a different dispatch favoring low carbon rather than the, the variable cost dispatch we use today. Now, a carbon price is the best way to encourage that dispatch, but of course there are other kinds of regulatory approaches. Some of you may have seen the announcement in Canada, which in some sense uh, is, a, is, a, is an implementation of this uh, program. So that's what this is, uh, is about, uh, and I think it's a, it's a very uh, important issue that if we are to drive down carbon, especially in the near to intermediate term, A, there are opportunities. Uh, we don't believe nationally it's as high as 22 percent. We're going to be analyzing that more, but there are certainly opportunities for this uh, uh, displacement uh, if we pursue that substitution through policy uh, and or regulatory measures. As I said earlier, with regard to intermittent sources, we will need to develop, again, policy and regulatory measures to facilitate capacity investment, uh, and finally on transportation, that we should remove the barriers to, to gas which come into both uh, the CNG world uh, and the uh, possible gas to, gas to liquids world. To go back and say a few more words, and I'm going to finish up on markets and geopolitics, uh, first, just as a general statement, and we can go into this, but we should, we should understand, sometimes we lose sight of the fact that the U.S. natural gas market basically functions quite well. There are issues in terms of keeping up with infrastructure needs, et cetera, but overall, it, it, it may, there may be time delays, uh, but overall, uh, it works uh, pretty well. Uh, internationally, there are some signs of integration of the type that uh, Jake mentioned. Uh, some cargoes in the Atlantic Basin, for example, going into spot markets, but it's, it's very weak. And we should emphasize, we are not predicting that global market because there are many impediments uh, to it. For example, uh, in, the, uh, in the result of the economic model, the Middle East would play a very critical role in supplying North America and Europe and Asia uh, uh, for that liquid market. Well, the largest resource in the Middle East is Iran. Uh, and it isn't hard to imagine that there might be some geopolitical impediments, at least for some time, uh, in terms of that kind of a functioning market. We could also mention Russia, et, et cetera. So, but, but it is an important, there are important results, uh, as Jake showed, in terms of the economic benefits. We would argue that net, uh, we believe that the benefits extend as well into security. It's a balance because the import dependence is moderated by diversity of supply and resilience uh, to, uh, to disruption, and by the fact that such a market uh, would greatly improve the energy security issues in many of our allies, and given the United States' very special responsibilities globally in, uh, in, uh, in foreign and security affairs uh, also helps us in that dimension. Uh, natural gas issues for these reasons, it's broader, it's really energy, but natural gas issues will appear more frequently uh, on the uh, U.S. energy uh, and security uh, agenda. And so in addition to supporting an integrated market, uh, we believe that we need much stronger integration into foreign policy uh, uh, of these issues, and that inevitably means we must have leadership uh, in this integration out of the executive office of, of, the, of the president, uh, supported by, frankly, a much stronger energy policy function in the United States government, uh, probably in the Department of Energy. Uh, uh, we should share, as, as, as uh, Tony said earlier, our know-how on unconventional resources and their characterization and assessment strategically. 
Uh, and because the supply chains will get more and more extended, uh, we should take a leadership position uh, in terms of uh, security. So going to a conclusion, uh, at a very high level recommendation, in the end, create a level playing field. Uh, in a carbon constrained world, that's fundamentally an across the board uh, uniform pricing uh, on carbon. And in that world, as we see, uh, gas will play, would play a very, very critical uh, role uh, going forward. Uh, in the absence of that, then if we are going to achieve those carbon reductions, we basically have to try to replicate as closely as possible what the effects are of that most economically efficient policy. And we saw that certainly in the, in the, in the, in the forthcoming years, uh, that's basically demand reduction uh, and natural gas substitution uh, for coal. Uh, and we support, however, continuing strong programs in terms of R&D, in terms of targeted limited duration subsidies for technologies appropriate to the very low carbon future that represent the other end of that, of that bridge. Uh, but it is a bridge. Um, uh, I hope we, we have convinced you at least that we have provided a kind of an analytical and quantitative basis for that statement built upon the producible supply curves. In the United States, that's very critically dependent upon the new unconventional, uh, uh, unconventional resources. Um, and uh, with that, um, we are going to open up for questions. Um, I will just add that uh, we will be having a series of background documents uh, published, one today uh, on the economic modeling, another on supply, or we hope at the end of July. We've had some theses already uh, public on transportation issues. So we will have a kind of a library of very much lengthier reports that support uh, 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 various parts of the study. So thank you for your attention, and I think we are open to uh, questions, uh, first from the floor, uh, and then at some point we'll see if we have any uh, on the teleconference coming in. Thank you, thank you. and uh, we, have, we would appreciate it if you could kind of say a little bit about uh, where, you, where you're coming from. <laughs> thank you. Is there, is there a microphone or, yeah, right in the back there? Hello. Hi, uh, John Rickman with the Energy Daily. Uh, the, uh, I was wondering what your comments are about, uh, your thoughts are about the current administration. Uh, the Obama administration seems to be very vocal about moving uh, towards, uh, you know, a carbon-constrained economy and, and pushing renewables, but they seem somewhat silent on natural gas. What do you think the current administration, policy-wise, is doing right or wrong on natural gas? Do you think it should be more vocal? I should declare a member of the President's Commission on <laughs> Commission of Advisors on Science and Technology, uh, but uh, let me answer uh, uh, perhaps slightly more generally. Uh, I think that certainly the, um, the discussion uh, on natural gas has been relatively muted, uh, uh, clearly getting a lot more attention uh, now, uh, I think, as these issues uh, uh, come forward. I, we obviously hope that our uh, study uh, in providing this, we think, analytical quantitative basis for what it means to move these, uh, these resources uh, uh, forward uh, will contribute to that debate. But let me say we should remember our primary conclusion is fundamentally with a level playing field, gas will do just fine. The issues really come is if we start, if we are unable to move into a world with a, uh, what we would call kind of a clean uh, a carbon policy, and if we have to patch together a bunch of energy initiatives, that's when, as Jake mentioned, uh, there's a lot more uncertainty uh, in, in, in many of the fuels. The other point I would make, and I, and I, would, and I would call out to our colleagues uh, in the industry, um, uh, I think it is both good policy, good for the public, and good for the industry to support and get behind, frankly, uh, some legislation that creates that level playing field uh, as we move forward to, to carbon constraints. Uh, Jake, did you want to add something? No? Okay. Please. Hi, it's uh, Marianne Lavelle from National Geographic Online. 
Um, Mr. Mix, I wondered if you could talk a little bit more about the environmental risk. You said primarily surface water contamination. Uh, where is that risk coming from? Is it from the production water? Is it from the active drilling? Is it from the production water that's left underground? And, as, and, and talk a little bit more about why you think and uh, the researchers think it is manageable and whether there's a risk of getting to that point where the costs of managing it could, could really reduce the supply as the supply and costs are related. <clears throat> Yeah, I, I think um, uh, the, I need to sort of put this in a little bit of context. I, I, I think that what we regard as the highest of these risks, and, and again, I, I want to get this in balance. This is, the, the, this is an entirely manageable set of risks, uh, not in any way out of line with, with what has been done for uh, over many years in, in the industry. Um, but, but we think that the, the biggest risk is the, re, is the returned water when you have done a fractured, fractured job. So uh, a frac job takes about 50 to 100,000 barrels of water, and uh, somewhere between a quarter and a half of that comes back to the surface. To put that into context, 20 billion barrels a year of produced water uh, are, in, uh, are disposed of every year in the United States. So this is a very, very small fraction. But, you know, it is produced water. In those areas that are well developed in the oil industry, such as Texas and Oklahoma and so on, there are literally tens of thousands of wells which are uh, monitored by the EPA, under the un underwater, you know, uh, uh, controlled by the underwater injection controls, uh, and under the Safe Water Drinking Water Act, uh, literally tens of thousands of places to dispose of, of that produced water. Uh, in those areas of the country, and I'm really probably just talking about the Marcellus Shale here and, and, and Pennsylvania and so on, which haven't had a recent exposure to high density activity, um, um, those disposal facilities are not readily available. There are some disposal wells, but not many. More could be drilled. This is very safe. It's properly controlled. So it's really about some parts of the country really getting the infrastructure in place uh, to safely uh, uh, dispose of this water. I think other issues that are brought up um, uh, are relatively um, um, you know, again, one should never minimize or one can never eliminate all risk, but, but the other issues that, that, that we were raised are, are relatively minor by comparison. So I, I, I think it's a minor, uh, it's not a major risk, but it's, a, it's something that needs to be taken care of in those parts of the country that, are not, that don't have the facilities for large-scale disposal. Can I just add also that there, I mean, there are some I mean, our focus was on these water issues, but there are other kinds of risks which were in our list of risks, but we didn't really address, such as simply, you know, surface traffic, uh, et cetera. Uh, but those are, those are not amenable to the kind of analysis that, that, that we're doing. Uh, that's one point. Secondly, Tony alluded in his, in his remarks, uh, but I think was a little bit squeezed for time, uh, that we do make some very specific recommendations uh, in this area. Uh, and, and we advocate, for example, requiring certainly transparency uh, with regard to hydraulic uh, fracturing fluids, uh, et cetera, components in the fluids. And I think uh, in some sense, I, at least in my view, maybe even more importantly, uh, I think we recommend the requirement of integrated regional water use and water disposal plans. Uh, and uh, uh, whatever combination of state and federal rem may, may remain to be seen, but, but we think that that's, that's, a, that's an important, uh, important requirement. We also think that the, the uh, constituents of the fracture fluids should be publicly available information. Yeah. Please. Uh, two questions. One, one very brief. Uh, I'm Bill Holland. I'm with Gas Daily. Um, the first question is, is it right for me to, to walk out of here thinking that the number one thing the gas industry can do tomorrow to um, promote its fuel, for lack of better words, is to get behind a carbon tax. Well, um, uh, sounds good to me, but I have a particular position. Uh, the, uh, again, well, the statement, you can draw your conclusion, but the statement is 
in a carbon-constrained world, uh, gas plays then a particularly important role uh, as this bridge. I, yes. yes, but for another reason. <laughs> Okay. I mean, there's a reason to be behind, the, be behind the carbon tax. If we don't have any carbon tax and have no climate policy whatsoever, the gas is going to do fine, and, right. and it's going to grow, and it's going to take market share. It's going to, these I things are going to happen. Away. If we're going to have a carbon policy, if we're going to actually try to do something serious about greenhouse gas emissions, then uh, uh, you, you, you can imagine, you know, I could construct examples where you would have a set of regulatory things that might benefit gas. The, the particular cases that we ran don't. So uh, I think I think it, that uh, the the, the um, if we're going to try to do something serious about green about greenhouse gas emissions, which fundamentally comes down to dealing dealing with two sectors, many sectors, but the big numbers are in transport and energy, and the biggest number is energy, and the biggest issue is coal. And so, if we're going to have a policy to deal with that, then then the most effective, uh, what I think is most beneficial for the total. Let's say volume of natural gas, if that's what you have in mind, would be a price on CO2. And also, if I may add, I, I think Jake would agree. I mean, and, and, I was, and even more important, actually, it's the most efficient approach for the whole economy. And in addition, is is of course very would would, would serve gas. A carbon tax is not is, is not an argument based on a desire to increase gas volumes alone. I understand. Okay. But if you're going to have a carbon policy, right. it's the most advantageous for for. Uh, up, up, among what I think are the plausible alternatives. Okay, uh, second question is completely unrelated. Uh, in, in part of your, your uh, presentation, you, you advocated increased research and development and, uh, and to support that increased government funding, uh, probably some tax credits, using the example of shale and I guess the Section 29 credits. Um, uh, any, uh, a response to that, how would you respond to someone who would say, what, None of these companies lost money finding shale gas. Why should I finance that? Why is that in my interest? You want to, okay, Tony. Uh, uh, I mean, I, I, I would agree with you that shale gas needs no tax credits at, the, at this point in time. What I think is important, though, is that, is that uh, it is in the national interest to understand. So if you consider conventional oil and gas, which has been developed you know, for 100 years in this country. Over time, as people understood the production mechanisms and how to develop those resources, rules and regulations through the Railroad Commission and other uh, uh, state entities grew up to control the exploitation of those resources to ensure that the recovery was maximized, uh, or at least economically maximized. Uh, and that requires, in order to do that, it requires a really good understanding, which built up over a number of years. Now, in the shale gases today, I would, I would argue, we, we would argue, and many people agree with us, that the level of understanding uh, of what is actually happening in the subsurface and the ability to translate what we know into a kind of complete understanding of the shale system with this huge and important national resource is limited. So while we can't say that it isn't being properly developed, we can say that we don't know for sure that it is being developed in the optimum manner. Now, no individual company is, is capable, I would argue, of, of undertaking the kind of comprehensive, across-the-board, integrated uh, work that is needed to really you know, bring the understanding of this resource to the same level as the understanding around conventional resources. And therefore, I think there's a legitimate role of government in the national interest to sponsor, in collaboration with you know, uh, universities, with, with, with industry, to sponsor an integrated, system-wide uh, understanding. So tax credits, no. But relatively small amounts of R&D money demonstrated in the past can make a big difference here. Let, let, let me add that the, the, I think the, the lesson from that example shown it was, it was a good example, now it's, it's going back 20, 25 years, that uh, it's a question of how one is going to manage the interplay of various instruments uh, to promote, in this case, resource development. And there are, we put there kind of three kinds of pieces. One is government, which tends to be more to the basic side. That work there was, was characterization. Tony identified some very basic issues uh, that are appropriate for a DOE program that currently doesn't exist. 
Secondly, however, was that piece which was much, much more applied, the so-called off-budget uh, uh, funding part. It required stability over 15 years. It required big industry cost sharing, very applied technology uh, development, testing, uh, and, and, and transfer. That's, a, that's something that we think is appropriate for that kind of funding mechanism. It's not a DOE basic research uh, uh, activity. Today, I'll be blunt, today we now have that instrument in place called the Royalty Trust Fund. It is, in our view, in my view at least, I would say, seriously underfunded, uh, under some stress, shall we say. Uh, we believe it should be supported and, in fact, supported more strongly. When and if l l we always emphasize targeted, limited duration tax incentives are appropriate, has to be judged, and I would, we would agree with Tony, that right now, for the unconven these unconventional resources, that's probably not a place to put that kind of, that kind of subsidy. But as we look forward, let's, let's fast forward maybe a couple of decades. Maybe we go through that whole thing again with methane hydrates, and we'll need that kind of, kind of interplay. Right, and, and Mr. Mitchell was, of course, absolutely essential in stimulating this, this, this program, the one, especially with GRI. There's a question, uh, oh, there's a question there, a question there, I think a question here. Uh, any, any order, okay. Uh, let's start here and then, then move over to the middle and come down here. Uh, Susan McGinnis at Clean Skies News. Ernie, you talked about, again, just a, a little bit more about this, this price on carbon, which you think is, is necessary, the best way to get this level playing field to achieve the potential of the, uh, what your study found here. Um, if that doesn't happen in a reasonable amount of time, you talked about, you said oh, there are other approaches that could do the trick. Could you, um, Talk a little bit more about those, and where do you where do you see the reduced demand, reduced use? Um, what do you see uh, uh, impacting that the most? Um, so many of us mm -hmm. see demand worldwide uh, mm -hmm. going up. Jake, do you want to uh, address that? Or the last part of the question, repeat the last. Uh, part uh, demand, the reduced use. Um, wh wh what's going to impact that the most? What's going to make that happen the most? Um, when many of us are hearing um, worldwide that demand going up. Well, let's stick, stick with the United States for a moment. I mean, if, if uh, I think personally, I, 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 would, I would favor somehow putting a price on, on the greenhouse gas emissions. If we're not able to do that, in my own view, we have to do something because I think we're running a very, very serious risk. And so you, you come back to the, to the area of, you come back to the, to, the, to the task of finding what set of things, if you're not willing, you're not able to deal with the distributional implications of a price, which is what the problem is. If we're not able to come to a political settlement about that, and we come into schemes which are less efficient, more costly nationally, but they do hide the price in ways that make it politically possible to do with them. My own view, I'm not theological about this, my own view is we have to do something. And but we'd like to find those things that are, that are the least costly and most effective. That leads you to a lot of things on the demand side. I mean, I, we're not, this is not a study of demand, but we could all go on and on about the things that could be done on the demand side, and there are lots of proposals out there to do that. There are things that could be done on the, there are things that could be done on the subsidy side within the limits of budgets and the kind of price, prices that we could impose on electricity consumers. There are various other, various other things that, that we could do, and, 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 and that may be what we, what we will do because we can't deal with the distributional implications. In terms of what's taking place globally, uh, uh, we didn't, I, I don't really have much to say about what we can do about the demand in, 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 other, in other countries. I think that, that we, can, we can do what everybody always says we should do, which is just share clean technology and, and try to reach agreements for mutually supportive reduction policies. But that's off into a domain of international negotiations far beyond anything we did in this study. I would just uh, add uh, more, a bit more specifically on, on the demand uh, reduction uh, that there are multiple ways that are coming into the results that are shown. I mean, part of it is uh, going to more efficient technologies, uh, so energy gets more expensive. And, you know, we didn't say it, but in that, uh, uh, it's in the report that uh, to achieve this 50% reduction, you know, we are talking by mid-century, let's call it in a couple hundred dollars per ton of CO2 
uh, a range. Uh, so uh, the overall economy, uh, let, me, let me also emphasize, the overall GDP is not being changed uh, uh, dramatically, but how you are using your capital and your, your other investments uh, is shifting around. So when you go and buy an Energy Star uh, appliance, you're contributing in one way to that, to that reduction. There is efficiency in build. We, we're going to have a lot more in terms of the efficiency end, uh, in terms of buildings, in terms of standards, for example. In the gas world, there's an issue of our efficiency standards to be, be applied end to end or only at the end point, which is a big differentiator between elect electric appliances and gas-driven appliances. There are opportunities for combined heat and power, many of which involve natural gas. There are behavioral issues. High energy prices change some behavior. So that demand reduction is a, essentially, essentially it's, it's, in that, it's, it's the economic response to shift from energy use to other ways of investing your capital uh, to uh, do the same, roughly speaking, uh, with less, less energy use. And again, we will address that in, more, in much more fine-grained detail in the next, the next report. Hi, Sharon Buccino with the Natural Resources Defense Council. Just wanted to ask uh, what you might have done to look at the um, impacts on air pollution, uh, whether, for example, in the Barnett Shale, Dallas-Fort Worth area has had um, issues that have grown, uh, emerged there as the amount of drilling has increased. And of course, the Northeast has existing problems in dealing with ozone as a regional issue. So how do we assess, did, what did you do to assess the impacts of uh, the drilling rigs and the traffic added to, say, the ozone issue there in the region? Yeah, well, I, I will be completely honest with you and say that at this point we have not uh, uh, we focused on the on the water issues because we believe that they're the primary uh, uh, issues, and, and we haven't uh, at this stage focused on uh, the air quality issues. So, but we will uh, cover it in our final yeah. report. Yeah, the whole surface disturbance issue we have not addressed uh, at the moment. There's a question, there's a question here and next, and then we can go back there. Hi, it's Ivan Semenek from Nature News. Uh, so this is a slightly geekier question, but I, I just want to get at this lack of knowledge about the reserve and, and just ask you to characterize that lack of knowledge. What is it that, what are the questions that need to be answered, uh, uh, you know, about, I, I don't know whether it's distribution or, or the nature of that gas, and, and who's best placed to answer them? Is this something to be industry-led or academically-led? Well, um, I mean, let me just focus at the general level, uh, because our general point is that natural resources, uh, uh, the, the assessment of the quantity uh, and even the quality, i.e. cost, uh, of natural resources is inherently full of uncertainty. Uh, and the reasons for that is because you are dealing with something you can't see. It's really very simple. Uh, uh, well, it's, actually really complicated, and <laughs> that's what makes it uncertain. So, so uh, you know, the re contained within those resource estimates are fields that are fully developed where we know really to within plus or minus a few percent how much we think we're ultimately going to get, all the way through to things in the Arctic where no, we no wells have been drilled, uh, where we have uh, just some probabilistic estimate. Now, these are done in fine-grained detail. I mean, there's a lot of methodology that goes into those assessments, but you're literally talking about resources that are potentially there based on geological assessments without, at the, at the extreme end, without uh, 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 any drilling having been done. So that inherently creates uh, uncertainty. Now, within, within, if, we, if we then go just to the shale, which may have been another part of your question, uh, uh, this is really, you know, we're all excited about the shells, and appropriately so, but, it, but we're very early on in the piece here. I, I don't know, I mean, a very small fraction of maybe 1% one, 1 of the, our ultimate assessment has been produced. So we don't know, uh, uh, there are several shale basins that have been unproductive, 
There are several. If you look around the world, most shale basins have never been produced at all, and we have no idea at this point whether they'll produce or not. What is it that makes shale productive? We know some of the characteristics, you know, to do with the nature of the rock and so on and so forth, but to be honest with you, there is no coherent framework right now for saying this shale is going to produce this much. We don't know ultimately what recovery factors we're going to get. You know in conventional gas reservoirs, you can normally get 70, 80, 90 percent of the gas out of the ground. In the shale reservoirs right now, actually we're estimating 25 percent or something like that. Based on current drilling technology, ideas of well spacing, we don't know where that's going to go. My guess is it'll go, uh, it'll increase that resource. So there, and there are characteristics. We're talking about flow regimes in the subsurface that are uh, uh, remarkable because of the very uh, small size of the pores. We have currently no way of translating those physics underground into macroscopic models of the field, which is what we do in conventional uh, uh, field. So there are deep scientific issues that need to be resolved, models that need to be built, and actually data that needs to be gathered from many sources. 25% recovery of, uh, oh, and, and we don't even really know how much gas is there because even measuring the amount of gas in place from a core sample today is very difficult to do because the techniques that were developed were developed for conventional fields. So, how much is there? Will it be productive? What are the characteristics that make it productive? What recovery factors will we achieve? These are all still, I, I don't want to diminish the accomplishments of the industry, by the way. I mean, a lot of extraordinary stuff has been done here. And some producers might sit here and tell you they know a lot of these answers. Comprehensively, nobody knows all the answers. Um, there's a lot of upside, but there's also a lot of downside. These resource estimates assume uh, that wells will last for 30, 40 years. Well, actually, maybe, maybe not. Um, so, lots to know. It would have been easier so, if you'd asked me, what do we know, rather than what <laughs> don't we know? <laughs> um, so we, we thank you for the self-declared geeky question. I will not characterize the answer. Uh, the, uh, but I, I, would add, I would add that we do have an explicit recommendation about the need for the USGS to accelerate the new resource assessment methodologies for all the reasons that, that Tony mentioned. Yeah, was there a question here first and then come back to Reed? No, uh, no. <laughs> Hi, uh, Dolly Krishnaswamy with Science Magazine. Uh, I was just wondering, sort of along the same, same lines, is there any research that hasn't been done in terms of finding more efficient ways to burn the gas? To burn gas. To, you mean the end use, uh, mm -hmm. com combustion, yes. uh, et cetera? Well, there has been, uh, 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 there, there has been a, a long history of work on that actually <laughs> the, the the gas research institute that was up there for that coal bed methane uh, had actually it wasn't only supply it was a broad program of of supply gas transportation and distribution and gas end use so so there has been a, a lot of that you know it's not it's typically it's not what I would call breakthrough uh, research but it's applied research that keeps cranking cranking up the up, up the efficiency uh, another area. Uh, which Dan Cohn can talk to you about later on uh, with this possibility for both, uh, for example, gas in combustion engines. Uh, there could be uh, advancements in terms of, which is maybe common to, to different fuels, but in, uh, advancements in terms of getting more efficiency, uh, uh, especially if with methanol, let's say, and um, uh, turbocharging and smaller engines. So th there certainly is a, a, a lot of work to do on the combustion end uh, in terms of if you're thinking about like furnaces, et cetera, we're pretty efficient already uh, after a after long, long program. Uh, Reed Detchen with the Energy Future Coalition. Ernie, you've now done these three remarkable reports on nuclear, coal, and gas. If you had done them in the reverse order, are there things that you've learned in this gas study that would have affected the conclusions of your other two studies? And one specific follow-on question. Uh, 
You talked about the implications of CCS technologies. Have you looked at all about at the uh, relative cost and feasibility of CCS applied to emissions or uh, to uh, coal-fired plants versus gas-fired plants, and whether uh, the development of CCS technology would advantage one fuel or the other? Well, again, the first question um, was in terms of the studies and the uh, time-reversed uh, uh, order. Um, I would say fundamentally not, um, although what I think maybe has come sharp, more sharply into focus with the gas study. In fact, let me, I'm sorry, let me make a prologue statement, which I think is important. Let's go to the very first, the nuclear power study. The nuclear power study somehow remarkably had, did not have Professor Jacoby uh, and the, uh, the economic modeling, et cetera, because nuclear power, it's about making electrons, whereas gas has this much more complex interrelationship across the energy and the industrial sector, okay? But now, uh, what comes into sharper focus, I think, um, uh, particularly in the baseline model, where you saw, for example, CCS economically did not compete for many decades in, our, in this baseline model, it all comes to emphasize cost. It's all about the cost of these technologies uh, as they are to be evaluated in the context of whatever carbon pricing there is, which could be zero, uh, where we certainly are, uh, I'm certainly at least an advocate of having a, a carbon pricing mechanism. So it's really about cost. So, so CCS, I think in our study there, what we, I think our impact there was in, I think, providing more clarity for what a program for establishing CCS had to do. It has been done. But the key issue is, in contrast, in my view, the key issue is exactly the opposite of, some, of what some would say. In my view, the long pole in the tent is not the sequestration. You can see a pathway to how that will be implemented for some appreciable scale of sequestration. Complicated issues, but you can see the pathway. But on the capture side, we need a dramatic cost reduction. Not, not a 20% cost reduction. I think we simply need some new technology that's got a two or three X reduction. Nuclear, again, is a big cost issue. And in particular with nuclear, as we emphasized in our first report, today, at least if you, this does not characterize today's reality, but if you were going to the financial markets for nuclear, we argued there was a big, going to be a big risk premium to finance those plants. And so a huge issue is getting the cost down by removing the risk premium. How do you do that? You perform. You actually build something and perform. That led to our major recommendations. So I think in that sense, Reed, I would say that there's not a fundamental issue other than this really sharpened, I think, the idea of the, of the cost test on all these technologies competing for their market share uh, under, under, a carbon, under a carbon price. Randy, uh, could I just please uh, add, I'm not to trivialize the point, but one significant difference, had these been done in the other order, is, uh, well, for me, I wouldn't have been around, but that's, that's not the big deal. The 2003, when the first report was published, the estimate of uh, uh, the sort of view around uh, um, shales in the United States in the NPC study of 2003 was 35 trillion cubic feet. Now, there may be some people in this room who saw all this coming, uh, but, uh, uh, it would have been a very, very bold study indeed that it would have predicted uh, somewhere between four and 900 trillion cubic feet of shale gas in, in, in 2003. So timing does matter here. It also just demonstrates really, uh, 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 you know, our real inability to call this stuff, which is why we focus so much on uncertainty. What is the shale gas of the future is the question that I really keep thinking about. Uh, and I think it's hydrates, and I think we could be here in 10, ten years' time. 
saying, uh, you know, that show is jolly interesting, but look at this stuff. You know, this is really a big deal. Because, and, and you know... And, and advocating tax incentives. <laughs> because actually, we've missed out our piece on hydrates. We've got a large piece on hydrates in our, in, in our report, uh, in our final report, and, and uh, I think it's quite exciting. And now people are beginning to understand that if you find hydrates in the right accumulations, not all the dispersed molecules, which people generally count, but where it's really uh, uh, um, in, in sort of concentrated form, if you can identify that and find that, it seems to me not inconceivable that that will be a very considerable opportunity 20 years out or 30 years out. Jake? You'll, I'll, I'll go back to the question about CCS costs and relative costs, uh, gas and coal. You'll see the table in our report. We have to make an assumption about that in our reference assumption. We, we show that the, the cost per kilowatt hour of, of CCS for gas is cheaper than it is for coal, somewhat. But for every kilowatt hour that you take Every, every kilowatt hour of CCS that you do for gas, you don't, move, you don't remove as much carbon as you do for a, for a kilowatt, kilowatt hour of coal. So the bang, the bang for the buck is higher on the coal side. Uh, so that's, uh, so I'll make two other points. I, it's a personal view that if we can't find some way to burn the coal in an acceptable manner, we aren't going to have a policy. So there's another reason why it's very important on the coal side. And the third point I would make is, I don't want to sound too much like Tony, but there's a lot. We haven't built any of these plants at scale. So we don't really know very well, ultimately, what the relative costs of these are going to be across these technologies until we've actually done this at, 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 at real scale. And there's nowhere in the world where we've done that yet. Now, let me just add one more small point, which is alluded to rather obliquely uh, in, our, uh, in our chapter, and, and that is that if one also thinks about a portfolio of let's say federally supported CCS big large scale demonstration projects, then we think there is a benefit to including in that portfolio a gas uh, yeah. a CCS project. For one thing, along the gasification route, uh, it does give a somewhat simpler project if you start with gas for gasification than solids for gasification. <laughs> uh, okay, another question, and then. Uh, Okay, and then maybe maybe uh, maybe we should uh, we have more questions lined up. Um, yes, a question back. Okay, so let's have these two last questions. Um, we'll see if. Oh, <laughs> let's have these three last questions, uh, and uh, then we'll see if there's anybody on the line. And then we will again. Our whole team will be here for a while to answer questions uh, one, one on one. Please. I have Bill Hahn again from Gas Daily. Very very brief question, and I obviously jumped to a conclusion on my previous question. Um, with with the price on CO2, uh, did you guys examine or are you agnostic to um, the difference between a, a tax policy and a um, cap and trade? Uh, or is that just a bridge too far today? We've done that in other in other in other settings. Yes, in this case of this study, we did not do that. We just we just uh, in effect assumed that there was a price imposed on CO2, and we didn't talk about exactly how that was done. There are others studies on our website that, that do comparisons of, of, uh, of, of tax and cap and trades, and we've also done a good deal of work on design issues and what the distributional implications are by income class and by region. So we've done a lot of that work, but it was not part of the study. There were two more in the back, please. Yeah, hi, Rich Hoffman with the Inga Foundation. In your look at the world market, did you, do you ever see the U.S. being an exporter? Uh, we, we didn't actually have an actual solution that did that, but let me tell you how we, we would get one. Of course, the United States does export now. Uh, we have imports from Canada, but some export to Canada. We export to Mexico. I showed you a case which assumed that, that, the, uh, that we were going to work along the lines of the cost curves we saw, which implies that, that, that countries of the world are going to develop their gas on an economic basis. If we, if we substantially cut that curve back, if we cut down the, the, the amount that we think would actually be developed elsewhere, in that, even in that calculation, the U.S. would become an exporter, yes. And would there are circumstances going forward where the United States could well become an exporter. Again, if a, lot if, depends, if, a lot depends on what happens in the rest of the world. Yeah. But, but certainly there are scenarios of, of, of the lack of development elsewhere in the world or lack of change in the structure of contracts in the rest of the world where, where you could have not in, we already do import. I mean, we, I'm sorry, we already do export. But where you would get increased exports, 
out of the U.S. and now it exports into places we don't export to now, certainly. It's certainly a possibility. Do you want to add to that? Right yeah, and, and I would, well, I would just add that, that and those barriers or those <laughs> barriers or opportunities, as you, as you want to phrase it, uh, could, could be geological from supply, but they could be contracts, they could be the geopolitical factors that mm -hmm. prevent that market from, from forming and then opens up yeah. more export opportunities. I don't think that's, if I had to say, what do we think is sort of more likely, probably not, but it's, a certain, it's certainly possible. Uh, was one last question there, and uh, great. Tony Yun. Um, so a question is, following up on the uncertainty and the cost, um, natural gas before there have been uh, perception that is very volatile and priced and could uh, prone to uh, price spikes. So how certain are you with your $6 cost uh, of uh, production? Is it a full cycle cost, half cycle, and what's your assumption on treating uh, produced water, which is the, one of the uh, greater uh, environmental concerns to, uh, regarding issue? Thanks. What, Jake, do you want to start with that first part? I think or? that's Tony. Oh. Yeah, the, the um, um, well, there were two questions in there, I think. I mean, one is about volatility, uh, which I speak of with trepidation because I'm not an economist. And economists don't like me to talk about volatility. <laughs> um, uh, but I will. Um, <laughs> You know, we've had a lot of debate, and a lot of people assert that the shales will reduce the volatility, i.e., the short-term volatility of of, uh, of um, uh, prices. I mean, I think that the structure of the markets in the U.S. is such that there will always be volatility. It would be foolish to think that volatility will go go away. Uh, there is, because there is a big inventory of, of, of shale prospects, I mean literally tens of thousands of, of, of potential wells that could be drilled, uh, you can certainly, and because the initial flow rates from those wells are often significantly higher than from equivalent conventional wells, you certainly can argue today that the ability, uh, let's say, just to go out and raise capacity in response to a demand shortage all other things being equal, I assuming there are rigs available and so on, is greater than it was before the shales existed. So that has the potential to flatten sort of price spikes. But I have to, have to emphasize that's a qualitative answer, not a quantitative answer. And, and I've had many uh, you know, arguments and discussions with my colleagues. With respect to the actual price curves, uh, Look, I mean, there is uncertainty uh, around those numbers, but, and, so, and, and one thing I haven't emphasized, but because we had to take many of these slides out uh, in order not to send you completely to sleep, but there's huge variability within and between these shales. So, you know, finding the actual break-even price is, is, is really quite a difficult thing, and, and we will show in our final report just what an enormous range there is. But having said all of that, no, well, the, the other thing to say is that the, the cost base is terribly important here. The cost of doing business in the U.S. Uh, in terms of developing is a function of the state of the industry. So the, costs, uh, uh, the cost to do the same thing doubled between 2004 and, let's say, 2009. So there are many, un many variables here. Uh, volatility will remain, I think, This resource provides the opportunity for that volatility at least to be uh, somewhat uh, dampened. Okay, thank you. Uh, Jake, no. nothing. Okay. Uh, are there any questions on the uh, telecon? Or I guess not. So we're going to close. We're not going to do one more thing. It's just totally unfair. But uh, since he came in late, uh, we'd like to uh, acknowledge uh, our distinguished uh, advisory committee chair. Uh, Mac McLarty, and, and invite him to say a few words if you would like. <laughs> you know, the, the, uh, okay. <laughs> uh, we feel now we are appropriately blessed uh, and we can uh, adjourn this, this session. And again, uh, thank you for your attention. And, uh, sorry? No. Uh, yeah, yeah, and, and, uh, and next door there's a breakout room. And again, so the team will, will, be, will be here and we'd be delighted to have uh, discussions with you for the next uh, several minutes. Thank you. <laughs>